Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our speaker series titled Genetic Testing Can Save Lives. Uh, my name is Allison Ross and I am Director of Knowledge Mobilization at Ovarian Cancer Canada. Uh, I'm joining this evening from uh, Toronto. Uh, I know for some people it's evening, some people it's, it's late afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start off with um, a land acknowledgement. So today we join together from across Turtle Island on the lands that we now collectively call Canada. We recognize and respect that these are the traditional lands of many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We commit to doing all we can to encourage the culturally safe care of all those affected by ovarian cancer and to use our unique position as a health charity to respond to the calls to action outlined in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So a big thank you to everyone for joining tonight for what we really know is gonna be a very informative session. Uh, as we know, prevention is the best way to save lives from ovarian cancer today. Over the next hour or so, we're gonna learn about the important role of genetic testing in ovarian cancer prevention uh, and answer a lot of questions, including things like, uh, what is genetic testing? Why is it important? Uh, what does it involve? Who should get genetic testing? Um, how to talk to family members about genetic testing and more. Um, so please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming our first speaker for this evening. So we're going to start with Michaela Schellenberg. Uh, Michaela, she, her, is a genetic counselor in the Genetics and Metabolism Department at the Health Sciences Center in Winnipeg, Manitoba. She earned her master's in genetic counseling from the University of Manitoba in 2023 and became certified by the American Board of Genetic Counseling in 2024. Uh, Michaela, Michaela currently works in the Adult Metabolics Clinic, having previously trained in the Cancer Genetics Clinic during her genetic counseling program. Before her master's in genetic counseling, she completed another master's in biochemistry and medical genetics, as well as several years of undergraduate research at the University of Manitoba and Cancer Care Manitoba. Uh, her research focused on identifying genes that are crucial for cancer development and progression in colorectal and ovarian cancer. Uh, Michaela is passionate about continuing to learn and educating patients and families about cancer genetics. So thank you so much, Michaela, for being with here tonight, and I'll pass it over to you to get us started. Great. Thanks so much. I'm really honored to be here. Does it look good? Yeah, it looks great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'll just jump in, given that we had that little hookup or hiccup. So today we're going to start by reviewing some of the basics of genetics as kind of the foundation to understanding genetic testing and then talk a little bit about what genetic testing is, why it's important, who may benefit from testing. And then at the end, we'll talk about some of the kind of like psychosocial or counseling aspects of genetic testing that a lot of people don't think about or are not always aware of and how people can talk to their families about genetic testing and their results. So I'm sure many of you are aware of this terminology, but I'll review quickly anyway. Um, so as you may know that most humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Our chromosomes are these little packages of tightly wound DNA, and they look like these little X shapes here. Um, and our DNA is the instruction manual for our bodies, um, and it's what gets passed down through the generations of a family. And like an instruction manual that's made up of little words to give it meaning, our DNA is also made up of these little sections called genes that uh, give our DNA meaning. So thinking about how our DNA is the instruction manual for our bodies, these genes or the words need to be spelled correctly so that our bodies can understand these instructions. So this picture on the left here is a stylized, simple version of what we, how we typically depict a, a gene. And you can see that there are four letters that make up the spelling of this gene. So A, C, G, and T. Um, and when sometimes when our body is copying this uh, DNA over and over and over again, as it's making new cells, um, there are some typos that occur in this spelling. And sometimes our body spell check system doesn't always um, catch these typos. So let's say for the sake of this example that we have a gene and it's spelled R-A-D. R and D are not the typical or not letters that we see in a real gene sequence, but just for the sake of the example, we'll go with this spelling. 
So there are some spelling changes that we can see um, that are perfectly acceptable. They don't uh, do anything damaging to the gene. So for example, that would be like rid and rod here that I have in green. So these changes, they're, they, the changes are still words. They still have meaning. Um, and so these would, we would say are tolerated changes. So we know that we all have these kind of differences in our DNA, differences than what the average person has or, the, or what we would expect. Um, and they're completely harmless. It's just part of what makes us all different from each other. It's part of the normal variation. Um, there are some changes, however, that are a little bit more rare and we don't know what these mean. So for example, uh, this example here where we see the red, uh, so the A is turned into an E. We know that this is still a word. We know that this word still has meaning, but we don't really know if it makes sense in the context that we're reading it. Um, so we don't know, do these instructions still mean the same thing? And we can't always tell what these rare changes because we haven't seen them enough in the literature, the research, we haven't seen them in enough people uh, to know if these instructions still work or not. And then there are changes that impact the meaning of our instructions. So for example, the last uh, example I have here, RPD, that's not a word. I don't know what it means. Um, so that is considered a damaging change that could predispose someone to developing cancer. And in genetics and in the cancer context, it's important for us to be able to differentiate between whether these genetic changes are acquired uh, or they, you know, we acquire them sporadically throughout our life or whether they are inherited and being passed down through family. And so generally we say all cancer is genetic, um, but like I said, we have to be able to differentiate between which of these genetic changes causing cancer are sporadic versus inherited. And by far the most uh, common type of cancer is a sporadic cancer, which means that certain parts of our body have acquired a certain number or combination of genetic changes that cause the cells there to grow inappropriately and develop uh, cancer characteristics. These acquired changes are happening locally in a very specific set of cells and are not being passed down through the generations of a family. Um, there's also a proportion of cancers that we consider to be familial, which just means that certain families are predisposed to cancer because they share a lot of the same DNA, they have similar environments, and this factor of these genetic factors and in combination with the environmental factors predispose, uh, collectively predispose a family to have more cancers than what's expected in the general population. Cancers caused by hereditary cancer syndromes account for the smallest proportion of all cancers. So it's about five to 10% of all cancers uh, are from hereditary cancer syndromes. And in these families, there is one single genetic change that someone is born with that is present in every single cell of their body that significantly increases their likelihood of developing cancer. So when we see a family in genetics, um, we one of the tools that we use to kind of determine whether or not a family could be at risk of uh, or have an increased predisposition to cancer is a family history. So, um, and sometimes we, or oftentimes we use this information to base whether or not someone uh, is offered genetic testing. So for example, if we have our patient here shown by this uh, little circle uh, and the arrow, um, the empty circles mean that that person is unaffected. The filled circles means that that person had cancer. Um, so if this patient comes in and um, we would talk to them about how this family history is not suggestive of a hereditary cancer syndrome. So we see that there's kind of cancer or throughout the family, so on both sides of the family tree. Um, no one in this family is diagnosed at a particularly young age, um, and these ages are that of the diagnoses are pretty typical for the given cancer types. 
Um, additionally, there isn't any kind of pattern of cancer. So different cancer syndromes will have certain associated cancers. And these four cancers that are shown on the screen um, aren't, this combination isn't really associated with any uh, specific cancer syndrome. The second family, however, is very different. So our patient here shown in with a pink circle describes this family history and we would talk to them about a suspicion of a hereditary cancer syndrome. So here we can see that there are multiple generations affected um, in this kind of one branch. So this maternal branch of the family. Um, there are people with multiple primary cancers and people who were diagnosed at young ages. And then there's also this specific pattern of cancers. So like breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and prostate. Um, those uh, cancers are typically found in a specific cancer syndrome. And then also pancreatic and ovarian are on the rarer side, which is also suggestive of a cancer syndrome. And so if we were to offer this test, our family testing, it's possible that a genetic variant associated with a cancer syndrome is identified. And so we can see that there, we would find individuals who were diagnosed with cancer who test positive with genetic testing. But we may also see some family members who were not diagnosed with cancer, who still have that same genetic mutation that uh, increases the likelihood of them developing cancer. And we might also see family members who have had cancer, but who do not have that same genetic uh, variant that's being passed through the family. And recall to earlier when I mentioned that sporadic cancer is the most uh, kind of common subtype of, of uh, cancers. Family history though, is just one tool. It doesn't always give us a good idea as to whether a hereditary uh, cancer syndrome is present or not. Um, so, you know, it can be helpful for identifying what families uh, are at an increased risk of, um, but it's not always obvious based on this, on the family history. So for example, we have this family here where we have somebody who was diagnosed, one solitary person diagnosed with ovarian cancer, somebody who was diagnosed with breast cancer later in their life. Um, and, you know, it's hard to get an impression as to whether or not this family could be at risk, given that it's a small family, there are a lot of male relatives, so it can be hard to give an impression. So by doing genetic testing, we can identify people who are at, at an increased risk and may benefit from different screening and prevention measures than what is typically followed by the general population. So with those individuals, you know, we can do our best to reduce the chance of cancer development or catch it as early as possible, which we know improves patient outcomes. And genetic testing can be particularly beneficial for family members that are at risk of those cancers that are harder um, to screen for and they don't have as reliable screening uh, tools. So, you know, we talked a little bit about kind of the benefits of genetic testing, but really what is it? It is a black box for a lot of our patients. So I want to go into a little bit more of the, the details of what it actually is. So like a genetic testing is used to identify these changes in gene sequence or gene spelling. So like I talked about earlier, we can look at what we would typically expect for a spelling of a specific gene. And then we can see, is this gene in this individual person spelled the same as what we would expect, or is it different than what we would expect? And if it's different, what do those, uh, how do those changes impact the way that the gene works? And so that's kind of on a molecular lab kind of level. So what, is this, what does genetic testing mean clinically and for patients in real life? So genetic testing can be helpful for identifying a diagnosis. So we know if there is a damaging change in a specific gene, we can say that that person has um, Lynch syndrome, for example, or hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome or Cowden syndrome. From that, we can give our patients an idea of what their personal risk is for developing cancer um, multiple, and potentially multiple cancer types. We can identify the risks for family members to develop uh, cancers. 
In some instances, genetic testing is really helpful for identifying uh, weaknesses that can be targeted by certain drugs. Um, and some individuals might use their genetic testing results to inform um, cancer prevention uh, options. So for example, someone who has a genetic change might choose a specific type of surgery versus someone who doesn't have that change. They might take a, a pick a different surgical path, for example. And then genetic mm -hmm. testing can also be important for informing screening practices for early detection. And I think at this point, it's important for us to differentiate between two different types of genetic testing, because in the cancer world, we often hear about somatic uh, genetic testing and then germline genetic testing. So somatic genetic testing is when someone undergoes a biopsy or a surgery and a few cells of the actual tumor and surrounding tissue are tested for different genetic variants. And so the, this testing is looking for acquired uh, genetic mutations that are present in that specific uh, tumor site. Sometimes somatic testing can be helpful for influencing management. This is different than germline genetic testing because germline testing is looking for inherited genetic mutations. So these mutations that are present in every cell of your body. And so this is done through uh, a blood test where they look at the DNA in your white blood cells. And those, uh, or that testing is helped or is used to identify a predisposition to cancer development. Sometimes though it happens that um, the genetic variants that are identified in the somatic testing are also identified in the germline testing. So uh, like I said, germline testing is done uh, following a blood draw. The lab scientists are able to take out all of the DNA from the cells in the blood. It gets put into this big fancy machine with uh, potentially hundreds of samples and they cut up the DNA and they line it all up using uh, this machine and computers and they can, uh, it spits out this kind of sequence or it looks at the, it spits out the specific spelling of all of the different cancer genes that are being looked at. And so then once we have the spelling of all of those genes, the lab scientists then go to the literature and different uh, computer modeling tools to see, okay, the, the genes that are spelled differently, how, what do we know about those specific changes and what do our modeling uh, techniques, what do they tell us about this gene? Is it, or this change, is it going to be damaging to the gene or not? And so after they do all of their literature review and their modeling, they can put all of those results into a report and they say, these are the specific changes that we saw that are different from what we were expecting. And um, this is what we think these changes mean. So we can talk about uh, next the different possible results that we can get for genetic testing. So the first result would be a negative result. So this means that we didn't find any kind of genetic change that would explain uh, a family or a personal history of cancer. But even though we have this negative result, we can't rule out a genetic or a heritable component. So I'll talk a little bit about that further. So let's consider these jars to be um, someone's threshold for developing cancer. And in these jars, we have these little red circles or these red beads that represent the different genetic factors that someone has that could predispose them to cancer. And then we also have these white beads that represent the environmental factors um, that someone experiences that could predispose them to cancer. And so we know once this jar is filled and starts to spill over, then that is when somebody would develop cancer. And the reason that we say that we can't rule out a heritable or a genetic component is because we don't know if the person that we're testing actually has quite a few of these genetic factors that predispose them and only need a few of these environmental factors to kind of um, tip the scales or cause that cancer to develop. 
or if they have, they may have very few genetic factors. So this is kind of the situation where I was talking about with the familial genetic, uh, familial uh, cancer, uh, familial cancers, sorry. Um, there are some families that we know just happen to have more of these genetic factors than others. And because all of these factors are so small um, and have to be in the right combination, there's no way for us to test them through genetics because honestly, we don't really know what a lot of these small factors are yet. And so in these cases, we would use someone's family history um, to inform us about their risks for cancer. So even though we have negative results, we can look at their family history and say, okay, we see X, Y, Z cancer is in your family. So we would expect you to be at an increased risk for these cancer types. And so we could provide recommendations on different screening or prevention practices. With these negative results, genetic testing is not indicated for unaffected family members because we if we don't have anything to test, we can't test family members. And then we would also encourage people in this instance to follow up with their clinic in a few years, because as we do more research and we develop better technologies, we can identify new genes or new ways to identify uh, a genetic change that we couldn't before. The next possible result um, would be a positive result. So meaning that we've read all of the genes uh, that we were testing and we were able to find a spelling change that explains uh, a diagnosis of cancer. So with these results, we could then provide patients information about risks for other cancer types, um, other screening or risk reducing surgeries could be suggested. Um, we could offer genetic testing for other relatives because we would know um, exactly what genetic change to look for. And for the most part, it would be offered to other adult relatives. There are some cancer syndromes that uh, we know there are risks in children, um, but those are very rare. And so for the most part, genetic testing is offered to adult relatives. Um, because it's important to note that, you know, any family member in that fam same family branch may have that variant. So we know if mom has this variant, her siblings, her parents could all be at risk of having this genetic change. And anyone who has that genetic change has a risk of passing on the variant as well. Um, family members with that variant uh, are then offered high risk uh, management and screening uh, protocols. And then the family members without that uh, genetic change can follow uh, the general population recommendations because we know that they are still at risk for cancer because of that sporadic cancer category, but we know that they don't have as high of risk as their other family members. And so when we find these genetic changes that increase, that significantly increase someone's risk uh, for cancer, that becomes kind of the biggest influence to their cancer development. So if we think back to our jars here, we can see that this red genetic factor is much larger and it fills up our jar a lot more than some of those other smaller genetic factors on the previous slide. And so you can see here that it requires far fewer environmental factors, far fewer genetic factors to kind of fill up that jar. And then the last possible result is what we call a variant of uncertain significance. And these are tricky because we all, like I mentioned earlier, we all have genetic changes in our DNA. It's what makes us unique, um, but we don't always know what these changes mean. So when we get these results, um, we, do not attribute someone's personal or family history of cancer to the results. So it doesn't explain their history of cancer. Again, we can't completely rule out a genetic cause because we don't know if this change is damaging to the gene or not. Um, but even though we have these uncertain results, we can still make screening or other recommendations based off of family history. And then genetic testing um, in these situations is not indicated for unaffected family members because if we're testing somebody who doesn't have cancer and they happen to have this uncertain variant, we don't know if that means that they are at an increased risk for cancer or again, if they just happen to in inherit this um, 
benign variant uh, from their family member. And again here, especially here, keeping in touch with your clinic is very important because with new technology, new research, new knowledge, these variants of uncertain significance can either be upgraded or downgraded. So as we learn new things, we become more confident in being able to say, okay, yes, we know this specific genetic change actually does cause an increased risk for cancer, or no, we know now that we've seen enough people in the population with this genetic change that do not have cancer, so we don't have to worry about it. Like with many things in life, there are always limitations. So there are some limitations of genetic testing. So we are not, for the most part, testing every single gene. The genes that are being tested are going to be different depending on um, the criteria that you meet, they'll be different than the, uh, depending on the province that you're in. And, uh, with our genetic testing, we're not detecting all mutations. So there are some times where we can have genetic changes, um, that require a specific type of technology to identify. Um, I talked about those variants of uncertain significance. So that counts as kind of a limitation where we have these results, but we really don't know what they mean. And even in instances where we do have a positive genetic test, we can't predict who will develop cancer. So we know that there are some people who have the genetic change that never develop cancer. We can't tell patients when they'll develop cancer or what type of cancer. We can say that they are at increased risks for certain types, but we can't tell them specifically which one they'll develop. And ultimately we can't completely eliminate someone's risk for developing cancer if we tell them that they don't have that familial uh, genetic change. Because if you recall, the sporadic, uh, sporadic cancers are very, very common in the population. So even if someone doesn't have that genetic change, they could still be at risk for a sporadic type of cancer. Another thing that we talk about in our genetics clinic is uh, this act that we have in Canada called the Genetics Non-Discrimination Act. So this act protects people from having their genetic status used against them in certain situations. So um, for example, if I have a patient who has a family history of a BRCA1 mutation, and this patient has never had cancer, but we have tested them and we know that they have this variant, this act means that an insurance company is not able to look at their results and say, well, we know you're at increased risk for cancer, so we're going to increase your premiums or we're not going to offer you insurance. So insurance companies cannot use genetic results and they can't ask you to get genetic testing when it comes to setting their prices or deciding whether insurance is given. And employers who are regulated by federal government can't use their uh, your genetic results uh, when they're making decisions about hiring, firing, or promotions. So, you know, we've touched on uh, multiple reasons throughout this presentation about why genetic testing is important. And I really just wanted to add this extra slide in to really emphasize that, you know, it can be important for identifying who needs screening, identifying who is at a, pop, a like a population level risk and who doesn't need to have that extra screening. It can inform decisions about um, preventative surgery. And for some patients, it can decrease their anxiety due to um, the uncertainty as to whether or not uh, they have that variant. Um, there are, you know, way more reasons than what I can fit on this slide, but these are just kind of some of the big ones that I've already touched on throughout uh, this presentation. And so ultimately, who may benefit from genetic testing? So there are many instances in which someone uh, could consider genetic testing. So if they have a cancer diagnosis at a young age, if they are diagnosed with a rare cancer type, or they have a significant family history of cancer, or there is a known disease causing a uh, genetic variant in the family. And we know when we have these genetic risks in the family, of course, we want to make sure that our family is able to do everything that they possibly can to maintain their health and get the appropriate screening, because we really know that this early uh, detection and prevention is critical for um, improving outcomes for patients, but we also have to recognize that there are instances in which someone may decide that genetic testing is not right for them. 
And so we always try to emphasize that genetic testing is a personal choice. So on the slide here in these various boxes, I have a multitude of reasons that I've heard patients um, consider when they're deciding to get uh, genetic testing or not. So for some, um, they find that right now at this point in their life, they're going through school, maybe they're a new parent, and they just can't cope with that information right now in this moment. So right now they're saying no to testing, but you know they know that there's that option in five years, in a year, that they can come back to it when they have a little bit more um, mental capacity or space to kind of uh, cope with this information. I've heard some patients talk about, okay, is this something that I need to know right now? So I've seen 17 year old patients where, you know, they, they want to have some more information because to them knowledge is power, but is this testing something that's necessary for them right now? If screening isn't going to start until they are 30 or 40, for example, um, some patients choose to have testing because they have a lot of anxiety about knowing they have that 50% chance of inheriting the variant from their dad, uh, or they want to know because, um, they want to make sure that um, they're not going to pass the variant on to a future child, um, or they want to know because they don't want to get unnecessary screening. Others might choose um, not to do genetic testing because they're already doing all of the kind of high risk management or high risk screening practices, and they know that genetic testing uh, wouldn't change that for them. So there are many reasons that someone would choose to get genetic testing versus not. And so we always make sure that our patients are informed when they're trying to make this, uh, uh, this decision. So we talk about the benefits of screening, but we also have to talk about the risks associated with genetic testing. So for some patients and their family members, genetic testing brings on a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety about, do I have the variant? Will I get cancer? When will I get cancer? Um, I've seen a lot of families um, have uh, are be impacted by genetic testing in ways like, for example, if a child wants to know their genetic testing result, but their mom or their dad or their twin doesn't want to know. We know if we test a child, then we kind of incidentally, a child meaning uh, someone's child, not a minor, but um, we would know then that they would have inherited that variant from mom or dad. And if mom or dad doesn't wanna know their, their genetic status, and we've kind of incidentally found out this information uh, about them. And some families uh, experience a lot of tension because um, there's a lot of blame uh, sometimes where people feel like their parent put them at risk for uh, cancer because they passed it on to them. Even though we try to explain as best as we can that you know, parents can't control which variants they pass on to their children, but um, there's still sometimes that kind of tension or that, that frustration. Um, there's also the possibility of unexpected results. So it's not unheard of where we would do genetic testing and find out that someone uh, uh, incidentally has two different cancer syndromes. Um, or they weren't expecting to have to worry about uh, a different type of cancer. So maybe they're family history is strictly breast cancer, but they find out they might also have to worry about pancreatic cancer, for example. And then some of the more rare cancer syndromes are also have non-cancer related risks as well. And that can be quite unexpected for some uh, patients. And so we really try to emphasize with um, our patients that yes, genetic testing is critical for all of these uh, points that we talked about earlier, but there's also these kind of challenges and, and, you know, genetic testing doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in the context of our big messy lives. And so each person has to decide for themselves if the benefits outweigh the risks. And genetic testing can be really hard to talk about once we have those results. So it's a new vo vocabulary for people. There's lots of information to remember. It can be emotionally overwhelming. Um, oftentimes for the first family member that's being tested, it's coming up at a really difficult time because they're having to um, also cope and deal with their um, cancer treatments or um, new diagnosis. 
And sometimes because of all that craziness, patients are just not ready to talk about their health with their family members. And sometimes two family members are not ready to hear that information. So when we think about how can I talk to my family about these genetic testing results, there are different things that we can consider. So would your family member want to know about their own health risks? And whether if that answer is yes or no, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't share those results, but it can help you anticipate their response. So thinking about how would your family member react? Um, are you yourself as the person who had the genetic testing, are you comfortable with sharing this information? Do you need time to process before you start talking about it? And does everyone have the support that they need once this, is, this discussion comes to light? So before you talk to your family, you might wanna consider asking a genetic counselor for ad advice. We um, love to do role plays where we, you know, we're a family member and we have our patient practice how they would um, share that information with their family member. Genetic counselors can also write family letters, which just describes um, the, the different risks and how that family member can go about get, getting genetic testing. We also recommend to patients to practice what you want to say uh, ahead of time with someone who is safe for you to do that with. And you can consider adapting the conversation based on who you're talking to. So if you have that really information seeking motivated family member, you may wanna share more details. Whereas if you have that family member that is a little bit more reserved and private and maybe uncertain about genetic testing, you may consider sharing fewer details. When you talk to your family, it can be really helpful to ask if they want to talk about it. Um, it's um, often better perceived when, you know, that person is open to receiving that information rather than them feeling like um, you're trying to give them information that they weren't ready to process. Um, sometimes having individual conversations rather than talking to your family member as a big group can be helpful. And having information readily available for how that family member can go about uh, getting more information or getting testing is really helpful. And you can, some patients also consider having one family member spread the word to everybody, especially with those really big families. It gets exhausting having to share the same things over and over again. So I won't read all of these in detail, but these are just some examples of what these conversations might look like. So can I tell you about this appointment that I had, or, you know, I recommended to this person, you might also like to, uh, to discuss this information with someone, or I'm happy to talk about these if you have questions. And of course, things become, a, sometimes become a little bit trickier when we're talking uh, to children or minors about genetic testing and results. So, um, it really is up to the parent to you know, know their child and know their maturity level and know how they re respond. And it's really parents that know best how to talk to their children, but we can consider um, the level of information that they need based on their age um, or offer for the child to speak to a genetic counselor um, because they can be you know, empowered with knowledge and also reassured that there isn't necessarily something that they need to do right now. This is just information for the future. And checking in with them continuously and keeping that conversation open if they have questions is, uh, can be very helpful. So I know I just blew through so much information. So if I can summarize kind of some key points on this last slide here, we talked about how genetic testing can identify these hereditary cancer syndromes. And it can be really important for identifying risks and screening recommendations and prevention protocols that really impacts uh, outcomes overall. Sharing genetic testing results can really empower family members to take control of their health, um, but genetic testing is not without its limitations. And we also have to acknowledge that genetic testing isn't right for everyone at every time, but despite without genetic testing, some screening measures are still available. So I would encourage everyone to kind of rely on their local genetics clinic because we are a great resource to help you and your family navigate kind of the before, during, and after of genetic testing. Kayla, thank you so much. That was that was so informative and you took some really complicated information uh, and made it really easy to digest. I really like the piece with the environmental and genetic factors in the jar that, that really helped bring it to life for me. So thank you so much.
Next speaker is Robin Martin. Uh, Robin, she, her, is a 26-year-old previvor living with the genetic mutation RAD51D. Uh, Robin received her genetic test results at the age of 25 after choosing to seek genetic counseling and testing with support and encouragement from her family, uh, especially her grandmother, Helen Martin, who is a 19-year ovarian cancer survivor and advocate. And I know Helen's with us tonight, so hi, Helen. Uh, the mantra instilled in her since childhood by her grandmother is knowledge is power, and that's really guided Robin in her ovarian cancer prevention journey uh, and her conviction that women and families affected by this disease deserve better. She's honored and grateful for the opportunity to share her experience and perspective. Uh, originally from Hamilton, Ontario, uh, she now lives and works in Toronto. Robin holds a MA in European and Russian Affairs from the University of Toronto and works in government relations, policy, and advocacy in the health and life sciences sector. So Robin, thank you for being here and for sharing your personal story, and I'll pass it to you now. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Michaela, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, and thank you everyone for having me here. So my name is Robin. Uh, I'm 26 years old, and I'm a previvor living with the RAD51D genetic mutation. And one of the things that I've learned from putting together this presentation is that my experience, perspectives, and feelings about prevention and genetic testing really involve a lot of people. But what I'm sharing today is just my experience and perspective, and I really can't speak for anyone else or other previvors. So to begin, I've known that I would likely need to take action to prevent cancer most of my life. In 2006, my paternal grandmother, Helen Martin, was first diagnosed with ovarian cancer when she was 61 years old and I was about six years old. In the 1980s, well before I was born, her own mother was also diagnosed with ovarian cancer, also at age 61, and eventually died from it, as well as her aunt. My grandmother quickly became a vocal advocate and got involved with Ovarian Cancer Canada, doing survivors teaching students and information booths at hospitals in Hamilton. I have early memories of me and my family at the Walk of Hope in Hamilton when there used to be a walk there. Despite my grandma being the third woman in her close family to be diagnosed, there was no identified gene. Her BRCA gene panel came back negative. However, she believed that our family history was too strong to not be linked to a hereditary genetic mutation. And as me and my cousins got older and my brother, we would talk about how someday we would need to talk to our doctors about our family history and see what, we, what could be done for prevention. My grandma is a big believer in being as knowledgeable as possible about your own health. She's always talking about healthy eating and exercise tips, her doctors and medications, and always repeating the mantra, knowledge is power, not something to be afraid of. And thankfully, as Ali said, my grandma is now a 19 year survivor of ovarian cancer and has survived three recurrences, an outcome that is an unfortunately all too uncommon for ovarian cancer. So my grandma Helen has always had this conviction and confidence early on from her first diagnosis that the research and science for ovarian cancer would be so much further along by the time her grandchildren would need preventive care. She had her blood work retested throughout the years and finally in 2016, the mutation was discovered. I got a very long, confusing, but excited email from my grandma, which I didn't really understand, but I, I got the main message, which was that her theory was right there is a gene on my father's side of the family that's causing ovarian cancer, and it's called RAD51D. She explained excitedly how cascade testing works. My aunt and father would need to be tested, and then if they were positive, me, my brother, and cousins would then need to be tested. So my aunt's test came back positive for RAD51D, and she had risk-reducing surgery, and my dad put off testing. We were young. So learning about this gene didn't really scare me. Um, I was 17 or 18 at the time in my first year of university in Toronto, and I felt fine about dealing with all of this when I was older. I'd been prepared for this news most of my life, and it felt easy to push off because I was so young, and the way to handle it felt straightforward to me. But there was another side to this story that did not feel so straightforward and manageable. I want to jump way back now to 2007. One year after my paternal grandma Helen was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer at 43 years old. 
After surgery and chemo and radiation, she was cancer-free for about seven years before her cancer returned, and she eventually died in 2017 when she was 52. I was 18, and my younger brother was 16. The grief was, and often still is, overwhelming. She was not given a genetic test, and although there was not a strong family history on her side of the family, I felt concerned knowing that she was diagnosed relatively young and that breast cancer is a cancer that can be hereditary, and I needed answers. So after years of discussing prevention as a faraway step that I would eventually have to take, I had lunch with my grandma after finishing grad school when I hadn't started working yet. I was so happy to be done school and finally become, in my mind, a real adult, but I honestly didn't know what I was doing. It was almost like I looked up and I was suddenly 24. And at the end of the lunch, she told me calmly but seriously that it was time that I talked to my doctor about my family history. So I asked my father again, and he leveled with me and told me that I should just go get the testing myself and not wait for him to do it. I booked an appointment with my family doctor in the fall of 2022, and my appointment ended up being with a nurse practitioner that I hadn't seen before. I told her that my paternal grandma had ovarian cancer and an identified gene and that my mother died of breast cancer in her early 40s. Or she was diagnosed, rather, in her early 40s. I immediately saw her face turn to concern, bordering on fear. Sometimes a look like that can make you feel bad or uncomfortable, but in this instance, it honestly felt very validating and reassured me that she understood. She took my concerns very seriously, and we agreed that I'd email over all the documents I have for my grandmother following the appointment. So I submitted my letter that states that I am a blood relative of Helen Martin and need to be tested for the hereditary gene. And because of this letter, I was bumped up the wait list and the wait would be a matter of months instead of over a year. So in an interesting turn of events, a couple months later, I actually got a job with Ovarian Cancer Canada. And a month after I started my new role, I had the opportunity to attend the Patient Partners and Research Retreat. It was a very moving and memorable two days with a really incredible group of women. And I bring up this retreat because I had a conversation with one PPIR member that I won't forget. I had not yet opened up about the fact that I was waiting for genetic testing to my colleagues. I'm pretty big on work-life separation, so in any other job, I would never have shared this, but I did share with my table that I was in the process of waiting for genetic testing. And one of the survivors immediately turned serious and urgently said to me, well, what are you going to do if you find out you have the gene? And I was a little taken aback because I was still getting used to having these personal conversations at work. But I said, you know, right now, I don't know what I don't know. So when the information is available to me, I'll make a call based on the advice I get. And she continued to look at me with the seriousness and urgency and said, you have to do something if you test positive. If I had the chance and could have, I would have prevented this. And this moment really brought the gravity of things to the forefront for me. And from being around survivors through my previous role with OCC, I grew more and more resolved that I would take every action available based on my test results. And I'm grateful to her. So finally, I received a letter from my genetic clinic saying that I was booked for a phone call for July 16th, 2023 with a genetic counselor probably about eight months after I was first referred. I filled out a long form with my family history on both sides of my family. And something that I misunderstood and did incorrectly here is that I thought because I had my RAD51D letter and my mother on the other side of my family had died of breast cancer, I would be able to request a larger gene panel or that I at least get tested for BRCA and my hereditary RAD51D gene. Basically, just with that information alone, no problem. So I had a detailed history on my father's side, and I had a semi-detailed history on my mother's. I did not call my uncles on my mother's side to ask about any history of cancer in my relatives over in Ireland, where my maternal grandmother had immigrated from. So during my consultation call, I gave her all the information I had, and I answered some questions about my personal, med personal medical history. I had zero issues with the fact that my father hadn't got tested. Um, my counselor understood, and the RAD51D gene only causes breast and ovarian cancer, so I didn't need to worry about his health. 
My counselor told me that I would be tested for RAD51D, but that I did not meet the risk percentage for any other genetic tests. She plugged my info into the computer algorithm and I did not meet the threshold. I was surprised and frustrated, but I remained calm and did my best to advocate for myself. My counselor told me that she knew my grandma and she remembered my grandma coming into the clinic every couple of years to get her panel retested. And she remembered the day that her, our hereditary gene was finally discovered. I also shared with her that I work at OCC, so I have some background understanding in ovarian cancer and prevention. And I, under, I told her that I understood she was in a tough position, but I was not going to feel right unless I could rule out the BRCA mutations and any others that can cause an increased risk for breast cancer. I told her that I was aware of the Screen Project clinical trial in Toronto, where you could pay, I think at the time, around 300 USD for a full panel, and that if she was unable to give me the full test that I felt I needed, I would have to go there. And I was really kicking myself for not calling my uncles and asking about my Irish side of the family. But I didn't call because having these conversations is exhausting. And my mom's family is not as natural about talking about cancer compared to my father's. It's very hard for me to talk about my mom. And it's hard for me to ask her brothers about her. And part of me also felt like they wouldn't know because they just don't talk about their health as openly on that side of the family. But ultimately we finished the call and she said she would see what she could do. I was not upset with her, but I felt annoyed with myself for not being better prepared. I got an email from her later that day saying that she would be able to provide a 19 gene panel test. I was relieved, but I also was like, wow, I really had to pull some cards and some strings to make that happen. I filled out the forms I got and, and I got my blood test done the next week. So then the real waiting began. Now that I was so close to figuring out answers, the uncertainty started getting to me more. And I don't think it helped that my job, so about 40 hours of my week, was about ovarian cancer. To be very frank, part of what I struggled with was that if my result is negative, I'm going to feel like I was being dramatic and emotional for no reason. And this is nothing compared to facing cancer. And during this time of waiting, I also met my now partner, Prairie. And I told them I was having this testing done. I learned that they had lost their grandma to ovarian cancer in 2017. Prairie told me that many years before their grandma was sick, in her late 30s, she had surgery to remove one of her ovaries due to endometriosis. And she asked the surgeon to remove both during that procedure. However, the surgeon refused to remove a healthy ovary. Her wishes were not respected and the surgeon only removed one. If her choice had been respected, she would not have developed ovarian cancer and eventually died from it. She was a Cree woman and a residential school survivor receiving surgery in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And it's not hard to arrive at the conclusion that medical racism and colonialism likely played a role in her wishes not being respected and ultimately her early death. She was likely at average risk for ovarian cancer, but her chance at prevention was taken from her. And talking about this together, I hope has allowed Prairie to not feel as isolated in their grief. Talking to Prairie has certainly helped me when I was waiting for my results and struggling with this uncertainty. So in late January of 2024, I got my RAD51D test result by my chart email. I read the lab result and I'm not a scientist, but it looked like it was positive. I was working from home and I did start crying. But I took some deep breaths and reminded myself that the prevention path would likely be very straightforward for this. And I felt true relief that I could prevent this and that I knew what I needed to know. But the real reason that I got upset was that there was no result present for the 19 gene panel that I was promised. And I hate uncertainty. And I thought I might have to wait months again to get that panel tested. I heard from my counselor the next week. She emailed me and said, I'm sure you've seen the results but I'm getting the lab to retest you for the full panel because it was missed. And she asked if I wanted counseling before or if I was okay to wait. And I said it was fine to wait um, as long as I was getting that full panel. So on February 8th, 2024, about a year and a few months after I started this journey, I had my final genetic counseling appointment. I was negative for all other mutations except for the hereditary RAD51D, which gives me a 10 to 20% risk of developing ovarian cancer 
and a 17 to 30% risk of developing breast cancer. However, this gene has only knowingly caused ovarian cancer in my family, so I was not encouraged to undergo a preventive mastectomy. I will enter the high-risk breast screening program when I'm 40, and I'll receive risk-reducing uh, salpingo-oophorectomy surgery when I'm between the ages of 45 and 50, and I have a letter that I can provide to my direct relatives to get tested. My genetic counselor also shared with me that the science and clinical guidelines could change between now and when I would need that care. So now, honestly, I feel good about my own situation. I thrive with certainty and plans, but I still have the comfort of distance. My feelings may change and I might feel worse about all this in the future. Who knows? I'll start checking in with my counselor every couple of years once I'm 30 to see if the clinical guidance has changed. And I do believe it's on me to remember to do this. But I also feel very frustrated that not everyone is getting the care that I've had so far and that not everyone um, has access to this testing. And very honestly, I feel guilty that other people may not get the chance that I'm getting. It's just not right. It's very fulfilling, though, to be a part of the prevention task force at OCC as a pre -viver. And if I can do anything to support research and improve prevention, it's a real privilege for me. So to close, I just wanted to share some, some short things that I've learned from the people around me. The first, at least for me, knowledge is power, and it's important to advocate for yourself. I had to push to receive the wider 19 gene panel testing, but I was not gonna feel prepared or comfortable going forward without it. You are the leader of your prevention and medical team, and you have to be as, form as informed as you can. You have to ask for what you deserve and keep asking until you receive it. Our healthcare system is not working as well as it should and can. You have to advocate for yourself. I wish that wasn't the case, but it is. The second thing that I've learned is to talk about it. I've seen people handle these difficult subjects by not talking about it and by talking about it a lot. And I respect each person's decision, but for me, and I think many other people, cancer prevention is tangled up in grief. It's almost inseparable. And that can cloud your judgment and make you feel alone. But for me, talking about it helped and it made it less scary. And talking with survivors and colleagues at OCC made it honestly feel normal and like just another medical appointment, which is what it feels like to me now and really what it is. And it's allowed me to connect with people. It allows me to process information better so that I can make the best decisions and be supported in those decisions. And the final message um, I wanna leave everyone with is, and that I think many of you already know is that more people need access to preventing cancer. It's unacceptable for people to continue to be diagnosed and die of cancers caused by these hereditary genetic mutations. Indigenous people, black people, and other people of color in Canada as well as people of lower incomes and who speak different languages and face other barriers are being failed by our healthcare system. Everyone who is at high risk deserves the opportunity that I've been given. Research, policy change, grassroots information sharing and support is absolutely key to changing these outcomes. My prevention journey is far from over. I have the information now that the real work will begin in the next 15 to 20 years unless clinical guidance changes at some point during that time. Thank you again, Michaela, for your excellent and informative presentation. And thank you everyone for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Robin, um, for sharing just so much of your personal experience and being so vulnerable with all of us. Um, that, was, that was really moving. Um, we're a little bit over time right now, but if Robin and Michaela have maybe 10 more minutes um, just to take a couple questions. And Michaela, I see you answering some questions in the Q&A, um, which, is, which is fantastic. Um, so the first question I see right now um, is from Jennifer. Can you speak to the value of genetic testing and opening up treatments in the early stages of a cancer diagnosis that might not otherwise be available if the genetic mutation was not known? Yeah, so I'll say that right now as a field, the pharmacogenomics, so the mix of, or the interaction of genetics with uh, different medications or treatments is really um, a new field and budding in uh, the cancer context. And so for the most part, it is largely um, still in er experimental kind of stages. Um, so, um, but yes, there is value in 
and will be more in the future with uh, in some cases where we know a genetic change. And if we happen to have a um, specific drug that can selectively target those cells or those cancer cells that have that genetic change um, that can, um, in theory, reduce um, significant uh, side effects for individuals. Um, and we know that sometimes people respond better to treatments when they have specific genetic changes. But again, these are all kind of um, still in those early kind of clinical trial experimental uh, phases. Okay, thanks, Michaela. And I just want to point out for people in the Q&A um, that Michaela has kindly typed some answers as well. Um, so if you typed uh, a question and you may be able to see Michaela has answered you, you'll just have to click on where it says answered. Um, okay, another question that we have. Um, at what point do you expect that advanced genetic testing will become standard of care in Canada? For example, RNA slash AI overexpression sequencing, full versus partial tumor DNA sequencing panels, laser sample preparation of DNA and RNA. Also, do you expect that doctors will, at some point, begin to discuss these options with cancer patients, whether or not they are considered standard of care here? Mm -hmm. As a now stage four ovarian cancer patient, I would like to have known about these options. Thank you. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> um, yeah, I know it can be frustrating when we hear about these advances that are coming in the news or when we're doing our own research and, you know, sitting there thinking like, why isn't this available for me? Because I can see how much of a difference it could make. Um, it is whether or not these more kind of advanced practices get implemented is really going to develop by, uh, are going to be different by province. So each province kind of regulates how or what practices they want to implement and, and what their guidelines are going to be. And oftentimes Canada in general is a bit slower to implement these things if we compare it to the States, for example. Um, and part of that is because we are a public healthcare system, right? So I can't give any kind of timeline, but um, you know, it's encouraging that there's all of this research that's happening because it really does help kind of uh, push these types of advances forward. Um, I will say that um, for the second part of the question about doctors talking to their patients, we are really making uh, big strides, um, at least in Manitoba. I'm not sure about the other provinces um, with this type of, um, uh, with, with uh, reg other providers talking about genetic testing, it's called mainstreaming. And so because we know that genetic testing is becoming really critical for all aspects of medicine. Um, those in the genetics field are trying to make it more accessible for other providers outside of the field of genetics to offer and talk about genetic testing. Um, and so, you know, as we begin to educate these providers more, yes, we hope for sure that um, they become more confident and knowledgeable and able to offer their, uh, their patients um, this type of testing too. Thanks, Michaela. Um, another question here. Um, so really appreciate your presentations. I'm curious if you know of any acquired mutations for ovarian cancer that are used to direct the type of intervention chosen. Also, if there are private companies in Canada, we can use to find out a complete genomic profile of tumor biopsy samples. Mm -hmm. So again, when I was talking about kind of the pharmacogenomics, that was it was um, more general across all cancer types. So as far as I know, there isn't any specific um, ovarian acquired mutation in ovarian cancer that uh, offers a, um, uh, a targeted kind of um, drug. We know that PARP inhibitors and BRCA1 and 2 mutations, uh, there are some interactions there. Um, but um, yeah, I guess I was, I was speaking a little bit more generally. And with acquired mutations, um, they tend to be quite random. So we can't always predict exactly what that specific genetic change is going to be. So it can make it sometimes a little bit more difficult to have those targeted uh, drugs when you could have 50 different patients with 50 different mutations all in that same gene, for example. Um, and then for the private companies, I guess, um, based on where I practice, I'm not allowed to recommend specific private um labs to test for. So I apologize that I can't give you any concrete examples. I will say that there are options for private pay testing um, 
in genetics. And I would just recommend that if you do go down that route and do want to look, you look for laboratories that are CLIA certified and CAP certified. So CAP spelled C-A-P, CLIA spelled uh, C-L-I-A. So those are typically the labs that have um, all of the different um, check boxes for being reputable. And to kind of build off what you were just saying, and I also just want to point out, um, I think it was Dana's question in the chat, um, how we actually get the testing, would even pay, lost both parents and both grandmothers, keeps hearing that she's high risk, um, and she can really relate to Robin's story and, and wants to know. So um, you mentioned, you know, you can't obviously recommend any private labs, but is the screen project at Women's College something you can speak to or... Um, I know that we do often uh, recommend that or suggest that to patients as um, a uh, outside of the public health care system, like mm -hmm. thing that they can pursue on their own. So that is something that we see as um, reputable and valuable and is definitely an option for a lot of those um, patients that unfortunately just don't meet our specific guidelines um, and still want to feel like um, they are empowered and taking steps to kind of get all of the information that they want about their health. So yes, we do recommend the screen project to people. Okay, wonderful. Um, and then a few other people in the chat, um, Kim here, I'd like to let my cancer sisters know that these advanced options are available in Canada. So everything just jumped up on me here. I'm blaming Marianne for that. Um, uh, where to go? They are available in Canada and BC, but sadly one must pay out of pocket for them as they're not covered yet. Um, CTOAM Vancouver, private genetics testing and counseling is one we have used as well. Um, and then I just want to point out that Stephanie has put the link to the screen project in the chat as well. Um, so the screen project is at Women's College in Toronto, but um, it's for it's for Canadians across the country. I can't thank Michaela and Robin enough for sharing their expertise with us tonight. Um, Michaela, you're clearly a wealth of information and you're able to break it down so clearly for us, which is wonderful. And Robin, um, you're also such an expert having worked with us at OCC and all of your background as well, but really um, being willing to, to share such a personal experience with us and, and sharing about your family is really meaningful. So we're very grateful for you um, for doing that. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we wish you um, a good evening and we look forward to connecting with you again at our next speaker series. Good night, everyone.